Traditional art school education is broken. Tuition prices are outrageous, the delivery is antiquated, and the information doesn't come from the industry. The art department was designed as an alternative to offer the best opportunity for our students to develop careers in the arts. We've embraced this notion of technology moving the arts forward. It's going to have everything you could ever need, anything you could ever ask for, and more. We introduced the idea of a brick and mortar school that's a hybrid of brick and mortar and online. All of a sudden you start to get the best of both worlds. I have the webcam on, I'm using traditional materials. I can summon up all of these other aspects of teaching that I'm never capable of doing in a classroom because I don't have those facilities on me. It makes no sense that seven of the ten most expensive schools in the country are art schools. TAD's tuition is affordable. It was established by the salaries that come from within the industry. I can now teach from wherever I want. Students can take classes from wherever they want. I can work over student artwork in real time. Students are able to ask questions right then and there about what I'm doing. It's a whole new world of education and I feel a lot better about the way I teach now. We wanted to bring industry to the students and because of the lack of distance, we can get the best practitioners in the world to teach our classes. Each teacher that's teaching actually works in the field. I'm still currently working in my field. It was the best school that I could find that would equip me for a career in art. These people are the cream of the crop of their industry and they're currently working. I'm not going to a school where my anatomy teacher is the best teacher who happens to be teaching anatomy in that city, in that region. They can get an anatomy teacher from anywhere. I do believe that people come out and they're going to be kicking, kicking ass. They'll be doing well. It shortens the gap between student and professional. Having these great teachers really puts the students in such a better place to succeed in what they want to do. You know, you're not getting five-year-old information. You're getting information that's exactly what's happening right then. The ability to talk to somebody that's been in the business for 20, 30 years, that has directed, that has character designed, that has animated on feature films, not only feature films, but some of the best feature films ever done, would have been just incredible. Hi everybody, I'm John. I'm the director of the art department and I thought I would start today by explaining what our lecture is going to be. Today we have Ron Lemon, which I will formally introduce in just a minute, uh, who's going to give a um, demonstration and a talk about uh, strengthening foundations and what a strong foundation can be and mean to the narrative side. Um, Sterling Hundley is in here with us and Sterling and I and Ron at the end of uh, Ron's talk are going to uh, go through some portfolios and do a um, uh, portfolio critique for a few. Um, I thought it'd be it would be smart uh, to talk about the art department just briefly and I thought the, the best way to start that would be to kind of give you our mission statement and our mission is to give you the finest art education available we want to help you foster a successful career in the arts by learning as much as possible. We have attendees from all over the world and we want to help each, each of you reach the pinnacle of your success. I think that little film that we just showed you says that and, in, and, and says it and, and explains how we, how we do that. Um, today we're here in this room and using a new technology, Adobe Connect, which allows us to do some things we haven't been able to do in the past. I'm, I'm very, very proud of, of what we can now do and how it is going to affect our classroom even in a, in a more positive way. It allows us to create um, uh, and deliver information in, in multiple directions, uh, sending in, uh, uh, streaming live, live camera, uh, I mean, our desktop using any piece of software. So, um, can I get Will? Can you put up, um, get my face off of here, which I can't stand talking and looking at myself at the same time. So, um, can you put up Ron's uh, 
work here, just to, I'd like to say a couple of thing about, things about Ron to introduce him. And I'll start by saying I met Ron four years ago um, in, in San Diego. And he is uh, somebody that's been teaching with us from the beginning. Ron has, is an inc incredibly impressive. His abilities go in so many different directions. I'll read a little bit of his background. Uh, Ron has worked in several different arenas of art, from representational fine art to illustration entertainment art. Currently, Ron works as a freelance artist and, is commission and a commissioned painter, and has a strong and extensive background in art education. Um, Ron first went into uh, action sports industry working as a layout artist, logo designer, and board graphic illustrator. After moving into more involved illustration and concept design, he went back to school. And I know Ron is a classically trained and has graduated from an atelier, the Atelier system. Uh, for the last 12 years, Ron has been a, con a concept designer and an art director in the video games industry. His clients include Sony, Activision, Ubisoft, Mattel, and many more. His freelance client clients include Upper Deck, Dragonlance, White Wolf, Time Warner, Wizards of the Coast, Image Comics, Disney. In addition to illustrating in his personal work, Ron has been an art instructor for the last 16 years. And you'll see very shortly why I'm so excited about having this guy here. He's got just massive capabilities. He's an extremely good artist and uh, explains himself uh, incredibly well. So Ron, it's, it's up to you for a while here. Um, everyone welcome Ron. Hello, I think. <laughs> there you are, yep. All right. We have audio. Hey, sorry for the late start, everybody. Um, we have a few little glitches to work out here, but it looks like we're in pretty good shape now. Um, I first want to apologize if anything sounds too nasally. That's the Adobe Connect technology. Um, it makes everybody sound nasally. Now, I'm getting over a six-week cold here, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh, everything comes out clear and my N's and M's and so forth all sound with the way they should be and they don't all muddle together there. Um, this lecture is going to go all over the boards and uh, I don't have a lot of time to do it so let's hope that for future lectures as well and uh, lectures on a number of different subjects. This one is going to cover a number of different subjects so hopefully we can uh, uh, get enough information for each subject out to you so that at least you get a little bit of a taste of what we're doing here um, in our foundations program. This comes from a collection of the classes that I teach in foundations, a little from head drawing, figure drawing, some from uh, composition and perspective, uh, a, a smattering from color theory and so forth. Um, and uh, we'll just see what happens here. Um, let's see. I'd like to share my desktop. How can I do that? There we go, the magic button. Hey, my email <laughs> for everybody to read. There you go. All right, got to move a few things around here. So the, what we wanted to kind of do today with this kickoff lecture was just kind of bring to you a little bit of what the uh, foundations program can offer you and in some of the classes and some of the information that we cover. So I do apologize if it doesn't feel like it's very linear and cohesive. Like I said, it's going to be from a number of different classes. And uh, we're going to kind of jump around a little bit and I have, I think, about an hour to do this, so I'll try to get to you what I can. I'm going to do a little bit from some handouts and some images that I've just grabbed um, that I use in my lecture talk. And then I'm also going to, at the very end, do a couple things on the camera 
Um, the nice thing about what we can do here is that we can jump all over the place. We can go back and forth from Photoshop to the camera, um, out to the internet. And that's what I love so much about this uh, education process and system that we have here set up is that it allows us to grab from just about everywhere and uh, throw that information at you all at one time. Uh, where in other classroom situations, like the brick and mortar situation, sometimes we don't have the luxury of all of those technologies at our disposal, so we kind of have to talk about it hearsay and hope that you get a chance to experience it later on. At least here we can kind of jump in and do it all at one time. Um, so let's kind of begin with the way that uh, this, this lecture is kind of set up is that we're talking about making pictures. And that transcends any uh, particular part of art that you want to get involved with, whether it's concept art um, or illustration, uh, storyboarding or story sequential art, animation, filmmaking, um, the whole nine. It, it, you have a story to tell. And the goal of all of the information that you learn is to have practiced it enough so that you can put it to practice intuitively. Um, and that's why school is so important or class is so important because I know for some of you it would be next to impossible to find that time outside of a classroom setting to actually practice and practice and repeat yourself over and over again. Um, and within the classroom uh, structure, you are kind of forced down a certain pathway of repetition and that hopefully helps reinforce the tool sets that you're trying to learn at that time. Um, the place that I like to begin with all of this is in sketching and in composition because that really is sort of the foundation and the, the armature for everything that you're going to build into, whether it's a single page of character designs or it's a single image or a sequential image you are going through the process of telling a story. And composition is a really important space to begin with all of that. Um, and I'd just like to start with one of my, one of my favorite artists uh, because his composition skills are so strong. And the other thing you got to really understand is these pictures are made up. And this is a result of learning and training and practicing every day so that you can abandon whatever you need to and embrace whatever you need to in order to get to a clear, clear cut picture. Um, this artist's name is Fortuny Matanya and he was uh, a war artist for World War I um, and he also did a lot of fantasy illustration. Um, and these compositions that he's created are very solid compositions and they're very involved compositions and he did everything from uh, like I said here fantasy art all the way to progressive uh, real world image, imagery involving um, the front line in World War One, involving things that took place in England, um, very big events, very important events from the Titanic sinking to a, a queen king being knighted or a whatever the case may be in between. Um, and he was basically what we try to build in this school, which is that, uh, that graphic journalist. He would take notes and lots and lots of notes. He would absorb the lay of the land. He would bring in different people and have the interviews with them, try to get an experience in his mind try to get the camera in his mind moving so that he could develop these images um, that, that would help entertain people. At the time, the, the photography technology was um, as uh, well used as it is now within the magazine or the book structure uh, or the newspaper structure. Uh, shortly after his career, the, pho the photograph ran wild throughout all of those different media. Um, but he was the camera for quite a long time. And also there are certain events that sometimes a camera just isn't present for and it calls upon somebody who can draw upon information and then impart that information graphically. Um, and 
like I said, he was one of the best. I mean, most everything that you see here is a result of um, made up out of the mind. Um, and that's just, you know, that's the power that we all wish to draw upon as artists. At least that's what I'm assuming that we are all in this for, is to be able to um, create a believability in the same way, whether it's um, fantastical or realistic or stylized for that matter, um, in, in the way that it doesn't necessarily need to be representational like these images are, um, we're hoping for something that's believable. And so we need to kind of take certain steps along the way and or at least grab and pull information from very specific topics that will help us free our mind and or also get away from the need for absolute reference. Um, now, that's not to say that reference is not a good thing, because reference is a great thing. Um, you can't draw what you don't know. And so you have to have lived or absorbed that information in order for you to create a convincing image, regardless of the style. Um, but to have the tool set to be able to make choices to go beyond the reference, to be able to sum it up in a picture that is elegant as well as um, uh, informative, and maybe have that hope and believability that somebody else is going to also understand it um, as clearly as we did when we make it. Um, and that's where your composition skills or your composition tools come in handy here. Um, so let me put that aside for just a moment, and I'll bring out another artist. Um, and this is a series of images that have to do with one particular painting. Um, and of course, the painting isn't named. This is the finished image. And we know this artist is Bouguereau. Um, and when we look at these pictures also, you've got to keep in mind um, how many nymphs do we know and how many satyrs do we know out there? Oh, that's right, we don't. It has to be made up. Um, and when we look at the image, the image is extremely expressive. It tells a story. It's compelling. It feels believable. Um, and it looks effortless. And effortless comes with a great pain to make it look effortless. Because these pictures look the way they do doesn't necessarily mean that this just kind of fell right off of the brush with the ease of, of this guy's skill set. Um, it took a lot of work to get there. And I have a bunch of images here to kind of show you how much work is actually involved in preparing. Um, there's all of these little thumbnails, um, little sketches, cartoons. Um, and this is only a portion, a small portion of the number of images that actually went into this image uh, for him to design um, from these little thumbnails here which start off in dozens and dozens and dozens. Um, you can see that there's these little figures, and the figures show very little structure. Um, if we were to look at a sketchbook, we might say, ah, this, this guy has a little bit of talent. He can actually tell some story through these little shapes. Um, but if we were to look at these, we would certainly by no means say, oh, that's Bouguereau because we don't see the skill in here yet. And this is not where the skill begins. Actually, this is where the most skill begins. It's in telling the story. It's in letting go of anything important as far as details are concerned, which really aren't important in the end. They just support the cause. But to be able to let go and try and tell the story through all of the elements, trying to connect them together in such a way that makes it feel fun and spirited or whatever that story might be, and find the one that counts the most and then begin developing it. And that's when we might bring in some reference. That's why when we might bring in a model or have a photo shoot and have these extra images so that we can then develop up to whatever skill level or to whatever technique towards a finish that we're looking for. Um, and so you can see these rough sketches that he's working from models. We can see more rough sketches working from models. And it, it looks like a painstaking process to get to what we saw earlier, which was that beautiful effortless finish. And like I said, it takes a lot of work in order to get there. It isn't something that just happens overnight. 
So for a lot of you who are first getting into illustration, you might think that illustration is just this thing that you do. Um, because you see so much of it posted up daily. And when you look at all of the different uh, blogs, and you look at all the different websites, and all the thousands of illustrations that are out there, um, and the other misnomer is things, uh, uh, Facebook pages like the spit paint page, or forum uh, threads like the uh, speed painting threads. What those are, those are practice spaces for people who are already involved in an industry and what they're trying to do is they're trying to better their part of the industry um, in a way that's sort of like friendly competition but also it's a challenge for themselves, not necessarily a challenge towards others, uh, but to improve. In concept art, we have to do extremely quality rendering in a very, very short period of time, much shorter than an illustrator has ever had because it's not about our art, it's about the idea. Um, and yet at the same time the idea uh, is facilitating an engine for a video game structure that is so advanced now that it does require that we do practically photo representational imagery on the spur of the moment, which you know in the past has been on, um, has never happened before. Uh, we're only now calling this to action because a need in an industry. And the film industry has been the same way, only the film industry, um, we can get away with a little bit more doing the drawings that we do because the rest of it is realistic. The only part that we have to be very careful about and very articulate about is the concept art, um, and the things that are going to be built by others. And we have to have a certain level of proficiency in both developing a drawing as well as building it out as a map for others to follow, whether it's a blueprint or it's an orthogon orthogonal view or an isometric view so that it can be milled or it can be hand built or it can be 3D modeled, whatever the case may be. Those are the parts of art that are important that the representational is very clear and sound. Uh, the rest of it can be a little bit messy or a little bit stylized. We can take some liberties there because it's really about guiding the camera around and allowing the, the filmmakers to understand what lens to use, what depth of field to shoot for, where the information should be stacked up, where the backgrounds should be positioned, um, and what elements within them should be positioned where. Um, that's the storyboarding aspect of it. And we can be a little more stylized when it comes to that part of it. Uh, but the rest of it, it does need to be very clear cut. Video games, however, are a little different because we're generating all of it. There isn't anything that has been filmed and brought in. It's all being built and brought in. Therefore, every part of it needs to be designed in such a way for the rest of the team to be able to use and use in very different ways from the modeling to the animation sequences to the texture artists to the lighting and rigging, um, what cameras we're going to use, etc. All of that is on you as the artist. So that skill set needs to be very thorough. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes school is too short. It doesn't allow you a lot of incubation time. And that, again, is where we come back to these forums or these threads on the internet where there's a lot of people practicing and generating tool sets that will allow them to make illustrations in 30 minutes or less, or whatever the case may be. And hopefully, things like composition skills and perspective skills and color theory skills have already been worked out because if they haven't, then that half hour turns into the half hour that it actually turns into like 30 years instead of it being 30 minutes. Um, it just feels like you're bleeding and you're, you're in pain trying to pull all of these things together. Um, again, we kind of fall back and say, okay, well, have you done very much with composition? Have you taken a class in composition? Um, because that will be your incubation period. And then any kind of practice that you can put to task involving the exercises that you were given. As well, if you're going to be an art director or a creative director or you have that in you, then you'll ask yourself or you'll actually say to yourself, okay, I've had this exercise. Now let me take that exercise and expand it over here. Or the question you might ask, what other exercises 
might be helpful for me so that I can expand upon this language of composition. How can I bring in more information for myself and turn those into exercises for myself so that I can continue exercising this outside of class? That's such an important thing to be able to do for yourself. School is a starting point. That's all it is. It just helps you set the building blocks up so that you know these are the tools that I'm always going to be working with. Um, now let me take it into my own hands to improve my own skills. And that is very, very important. And I think a lot of us uh, kind of squander our extra time and go off and do other things because now that we've made it through school and now that we have the job, oh, now let me just go rest and play and enjoy myself on the side. But we need to really think about that time that we're spending and partition it well enough so that, yes, we do get a chance to go out and play. But at the same time, find time to build these exercises and continue developing our skill set. So there's a number of different exercises that we can do um, that help us get there. And there's a number of different tools as well um, that can help us get to that place that we're looking for. Um, one of them being in the composition classes that I show, um, there's this thing that we build upon for extremely developed imagery, and that's called the armature or the grid. And when we look at a lot of these illustrations from the past, these paintings, they're almost perfect when we look at them. We look at them and wonder how everything was put where it was. Now, some things we need to keep in mind. When we have a story, we need to summarize the story so that we know what we're going to be searching for. That really helps us. And so we want to maybe give ourselves one or two sentences in brief as to what the motivation is going to be. And then we need to think about this like a movie director, uh, quite honestly, because we're directing the moment, we're directing the scene. And if we don't know how to kind of call all that information together, then it, it can be a little confusing sometimes because we might put too much into the picture all at one time. So some of the things that we draw upon fall back to the old masters, and one of those is building on the armature, which is these crazy looking geometric grids. Now keep in mind that in the Renaissance, the Renaissance was about discovery, and one of those discoveries was geometry. So you have a lot of great artists who are all showing off all of their skills, not just that they can paint and they can draw, but that they can put it all into this thing we call sacred geometry. Um, and we can organize it in such a way that bedazzles people. And that's, I think, where a lot of these old artists got the idea of beauty, because so much of this geometry seemed to come out of nowhere all of a sudden. And yet, when we calculate these, these problems, it builds this thing called a grid, and we can put all the artwork into it, and it feels so harmonious and so perfect. And that was their inspiration for a lot of this stuff. And a lot of this stuff is just absolutely mind-boggling. If you don't do geometry too much yourself, then it's just it's a totally foreign language. Uh, but it's something to draw upon. What we have now in the modern structure is called the three by three. Um, three squares across by three squares down. And then we divide that up three times. And what that'll get us is that'll get us a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary focal point. Where with these, there was a target. And the target had all the geometry kind of pointing you towards it. Um, regardless of whether this target was built off of like a spherical design as we see here, or it was built off of something even more insane. Um, this is sort of a, a, a loose armature. Now this doesn't have the sacred geometry that sits behind it that holds it all in place, but you can kind of see that there is a structure going on here. And if you notice, the structure goes back to the corners of the canvas that's being, that, that all of this is being depicted within. And that's how it begins. It's not just like we throw a bunch of stuff together in hopes that it's going to present us with a, a beautiful geometric configuration. It all has to do with the size of the picture space and how it all points back to the corners because the corners begin the whole measurement structure. If you've ever cut a square down, but you wanted to keep its proportions, you build on a diagonal from corner to corner. And that's what the geometry promises here, is that 
from corner to corner, we can scale things up and down as well. We can link other things to it. Um, and it's the easiest place for us to begin. Now, this isn't the end all be, and I'm just showing you a few of these as examples, but it's a place to start because if we are going to build some of these extremely um, expansive canvases and uh, we're going to add a lot of information that might be overwhelming, we have to somehow find a way to organize them. So on the premise of this geometry and grouping of shapes, um, it helps us understand that if we pull things together, whether they're colors or values, whether they're groupings of people in twos or threes or maybe fives and sevens, um, we have a way of organizing the space so that we can maybe set everything else back to bring a, a focal point forward, um, something more important than everything else. And maybe also we can get all those things to point towards it without it looking too theatrically staged. However, though, just like theater, everything does need to be staged to some extent. Now, this is where the good from the great come from. Good artists can organize it really well, make it feel a little bit staged. Great artists can make it feel amazing and that like it just happens. They can hide it all within that space um, and not make it look so staged that it's contrived. Um, but it starts in, in contrivances. We all have to start there. We all have to start with everybody's going to point their finger towards the focal point. And then we figure out how to kind of find another arrow to point at the focal point, whether it's an elbow or whether it's the way someone's eyes are looking at somebody else or the way we group shapes together, the way we group values together, the way we group colors together to pull yourself into that focal point. Um, these are tools that then come out of this experience of grouping and organizing and so forth. And this is where we start down that pathway of what else can I do to make a solid picture? Now, I want to show you one more uh, because some of these grids look absolutely insane. But when we really think about how all of this worked, um, we don't have photographs, obviously, of the old Renaissance painters, but we do have photographs of some newer painters using something very similar. And this is Antonio Mancini, and he's using what's called the Graticola. And the Graticola is a physical grid, which is sort of a, a descendant from the Dürer grid. Dürer, Albrecht Dürer, created this grid system that you look through and that you paint through. And old canvases like Peter Paul Rubens have little notches on the back of the canvas frame that show us that they gridded those as well. They would tie strings to the canvas and they would grid the canvas space. So they were very meticulous about how they put a picture together. And here you can see that the Graticola sits in front of the model and that another one sits in front of the canvas and that this painter is going from grid mark to grid mark and he's painting in the little spaces. Um, now you might say, ah, color by numbers. I don't know if I really like this or not. but Keep in mind that for a long time, there were only so many conventions for teaching realism. And a lot of them stemmed upon things that mimicked photography. And these were hand-built objects that helped create the photographic experience. When we look at painters like Peter Paul Rubens, we can see that he's going a little beyond the photography because he's creating extremely dynamic and powerful figures extremely dynamic and powerful settings. And so he obviously had a facility for being able to go beyond the photograph or the photographic means, the grids and so forth. Um, but it still started with something that was more, uh, more hinged upon something absolute. And once he practiced enough, he could let go. And that's the same way with all of us. We don't need these tools the rest of our lives we need them as training tools to help us create an intuitive sensibility so that we can let them go. Because ultimately, in the end, you're searching for something new. And a lot of these grid systems come from something absolute, and they all have symbolic representation to them after the fact. Right? We can tie and attribute certain terms and certain qualities of the way we feel to a lot of these types of grids whether the grid's in a triangle form, or it's in a horizontal format at rest, or a vertical format, meaning power, a circular format, infinity, connection, tying together, familiarity. You know, we, there's words that tie to 
to all of these different distinct shapes. And that's our basic language. We need to start with a, a basic language so that we have something that we can begin with, something that we can tie back to, and as well, it's a safety net. If for some reason I've experimented 500 ways and I can't come up with something, well, then I'm going to go back to that thing that's already been done, and I'm going to start there again. Because at least there I know oh, it's been done, it's tested, tried, and true. And so I know that I can reach for that as a means of getting this thing done when my search for newness just came up with absolutely nothing. But the more that you practice doing all of these things, the easier that symbolic language will be for you. And that's the beautiful thing about composition. Now, let me move over into some other charts here. Um, I've got things all over my desktop here, so I apologize for me being a little slow. Hey, Ron. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. The images are quite small in your screen sharing. If you want to hit uh, F to get rid of the UI in Photoshop, may you make it full screen and zoom in on the images a bit. It would help us see more clearly what's going on. Yeah, that's better already. And then if you press Command-0, Control-0, you'll fit the image to screen if you're not using any of the brushes in the UI. There you go. Ah, beautiful. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. Thank you. My, my apologies for that. Um, I can't see what I'm showing, so thank you. I really appreciate that, Dorian. Okay, so there's other structural keys as well, and this one is called a major and minor tonal key. Tonal keys can be equated to music, uh, playing different tones. On, say, a piano, you have all of the different octaves, which produce a different tonality. Um, as well, the note structure produces a different range of tones. Um, picture making is the same way. So this is another part of our language, the way that things interact with each other in terms of light and dark. How do we present a certain mood? Well, we have that armature to begin with. That's one. Um, then we also have the tonality. And before we add any, any color, we're looking purely at the vividness of the imagery, the lightness and the darkness, or the combination thereof, and how we can get to certain types of tones in a way that will help affect the picture, it will help affect the viewer. Um, it, 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 it creates something very profound in the imagery, and then it affects the viewer. So this is another part of our language. And this, again, comes from uh, the whole root basis for composition, just one more tool in the toolbox. So when I look at composition as a class, or when I look at composition as one of the skill sets that we need for building pictures, I call composition the basic language, the alphabet and the basic word structure for a picture. And then there's all the other accompanying tools. There's perspective and color theory, which accompany that. And then to accompany that, you have figure drawing, animal drawing, portraiture, and et cetera, and so on. Um, but this is sort of, this is the nuts and bolts. If we can master this in some way, then we can master how to have a dialogue with other people in, in our images. Um, so I'm going to kind of bounce around here in this little stack. I have a few other handouts here that I'd like to share. And then we can move on. Um, my F keys are going faster than my fingers. Okay, a little bit more on key structure. This was a demo, a working demo that uh, we did. All of the demos that I do in class, or every class I try and do a demo on, the, on what we're talking about. And I try to do them as quickly and spontaneously as possible. Um, so some of these um, may feel a little messy when you look at them here um, in this presentation. Um, but in the classroom setting, this was a very important page that helped kind of explain that day's concept. Um, and again, we're looking at the major and minor key structure through the idea of just simple portraiture. Because when we, we 
break things down, we try to break it down from a basic point of view first, rather than getting too far off into, say, one of those multi-figure Rubens epics. Uh, we try to start with something very simple, like the, the basis for putting someone on a canvas within a portraiture structure. Uh, and then how do we create a mood and a setting using just that particular aspect first? Um, and then we have other tools here. Um, this is just something that I grabbed from the internet. Um, I can't find my handout right now offhand, but elements and principles, uh, the design elements and principles. Again, another part of the language, another part of the language that we speak through. And these key, these are key tools right here. We have seven elements, eight principles, and in combination, we have an endless array of tool sets that we can talk through. Couple that with a grid, couple that with the major and minor key of structure, couple that with value grouping, your value scale, couple that with the uh, design elements, which would mean that here's something new for all of you to kind of chew on. Pictures are only made in three types. They're made either in line, they're made in no tan, which means tone, or they're made in form, chiaroscuro. Uh, three-dimensionality. And almost every major picture that we've ever looked at have all three of those within. One of those is always a dominant over the others. Now if we have that plus our major and minor key of value plus our armature plus these, look how much stronger your vocabulary will be. Look how much more dynamic the range is for you to build a picture or to build a design. When you're doing concept art, it's the same thing. You're pulling from all of these tools. You might just be making a single figure. You might just be making the next badass crate for the Quake engine. Um, but regardless of whatever it is that you're trying to design, you're pulling from this key structural set of information uh, to help you design or to help you create, manipulate, and organize. So this is the importance of composition. Let me see if I have anything else here. Um, within this. Okay, so these are just a couple pages of handouts where I put to example each tool. Um, because, you know, it's one thing to see those design elements and principles on their own, but it's another thing then to actually organize them and control them and connect them together so that we can see how it works, right? It, it's like, okay, I can see the ABCs, but well, how do you make words with them, right? And we have to combine them together until we can form sentences, or we can form words that form sentences, to form paragraphs, etc. Same thing here. We go through each tool by itself, and we look at it in its individual space. And then we put it into a picture space so that we can put it to practice. We can actually find a way to use it so that these aren't just a bunch of words that we read and go, oh yeah, okay, I know composition now. We don't really know it until we've practiced it. Now, Andrew Loomis has a great book, Creative Illustration, that has a number of these things in there. And I think that it's a great book for imparting the definition. Um, but there is no exercises in there, and there is no putting it to practice necessarily. That's up to us, or that's on us. And sometimes that's where a composition class really does help decipher a book like that. We're thankful that guys like Andrew Loomis were writing books of that sort because not very many people did. A lot of this art knowledge was kind of behind closed doors within the studio setting, and it was passed on from the artist to his apprentice. And that's how most of this information disappeared in a great way in the 20th century. Uh, a lot of the art schools during the mid 20th century had no more tools to teach because they didn't have any to teach in the first place. They sort of let all of that go. But that did introduce an entirely new chapter of art, which is to experiment with the materials and create things using those materials. And so in the way that I look at all of this, is I, but it's not like we should throw anything out ever, which is what those those years of instruction did. For each new art movement, we throw out another rule. I think it's really important that we keep all these rules, 
and we introduce the new things and the newer things and so forth. And then that allows you endless possibilities to decide which direction you'd like to go in. You're not shortchanged at that point. You can create a painting in the vein of the Dadaist. You can lean back upon Rubens if you need to. In fact, the way that I look at it is that all this academic study is nothing but fallback. If you can't find it when you're out here searching for it in some other way, that's the safety net. That's the fallback. And to be able to fall back and actually paint a Bouguereau or a Rubens, it's kind of a nice fallback. But at the same time, it's not the end-all be because it has already been done. What more can you do with it? And to be able to build upon this information, it does require that you know the information that came first, or else you might just be reinventing what already has been without realizing it. And that, you know, in, in some ways that's kind of fun to be able to find and discover, but then when you realize you're discovering something that's already been, then it, it almost feels like you've wasted a little bit of time and you're not moving forward in the way that you could be. So all of it counts. Everything counts. So in the composition class, we also discover the materials. And we look at a number of different art movements um, that utilize some of these skills. Now keep in mind that almost every major art movement that's been has been produced by somebody who was educated in the first place and allowed to let go of certain things and grab a hold of other things because they understood the tool sets well enough that they could kind of do that. And then there's a number of painters and artists that follow who don't necessarily know what they're doing with it. It's just the sign of the times, and this is what we must do, therefore we do. But it's those key people that start those movements that we want to look at, and we want to figure out, well, why did it start that way? And what tools were they really using? Because just about all of those art movements, as much as they say they let go of things, they actually grasped a hold of one small concept and just filtered around that rather than using all of these all at the same time. But that's the fun of art, right? You have the ability to flex that art muscle as broadly or as focused as possible to create newness in art. And that's a, a fun discovery that we still have yet to get to. All right, so now when we look at, say, the other part of making a picture, we have to look at the color structure. And the color structure begins with understanding light, light and shade. And so in a lot of the exercises that I start with in this class in color theory, I begin with building upon the idea of the, chromosca the chromascape. And the chromascape is something that goes from a higher chroma to a lower chroma. And all that basically means is that in high chroma, we're looking at something that's impressionable. Um, we're looking at colors that have been enhanced. When you look around in the world, everything kind of feels a little bit muted, but everything has a color to it to some extent because light lights us. The blue sky is one light source. The yellow sun is the other. And all things under that lighting have been lit by one or the other. So your shadows, as much as we call them shadows, they're nothing more than a dimmer light source. They're the darker light of the two. And yet they're still being lit. Um, and that, so that darker side is being just as influenced as the lit side, a powerful light source and a, dim, a, a slightly diminished light source. And together with that plus the, the object and the color of the object, you get the color of things. And so this high key and low key chroma practice is nothing more than training the eye to see gray things as colors. Um, and I think that's where sometimes when we paint pictures, especially from photographs, if we don't think about it being a real world setting, we merely just copy the photograph. But in reality, what we want to think about is that photograph was taken somewhere. Where was it? Well, you know, it was outside. It was indoors. It was under the fog. It was under the bright blue sky, say at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock. And everything has been affected by the lighting and by the shape. So when we look at colors in a high key sense, what we do is we remove black because black is a valid color that we put on our palette. It helps us gray things down a little bit or sometimes darken and toning a color down that might be really light in value. Uh, we get rid of black and we substitute it with color. And the colors are based upon temperature, warms and cools, which again fall back to our light sources, as well local colors of objects. If something's yellow, 
Um, it might be warm. If it's like a lemon yellow, it could be coolish on the surface, but we also have inherent temperature on the surface value of every object. So we think about that. Then we think about the light source that's hitting it. And together, the two of those will create a unique color that we want to mix and match so that it makes our impression that much stronger when we make it. Um, now all of a sudden our picture starts to look like it's being lit by the sun. Now it's very garish and very, very colorful, and that's what this picture is over here. It looks a little, sometimes a little rough, um, a little harsh to the system if you're used to tonalism. Um, but it is a dynamic exercise in helping you see that gray things do have color temperature to them too. And so that high key structure helps you find it. The low key structure helps you tone things down and look for the value of color, the lightness and the darkness. So those bright yellow bananas, now we have to find a way of dimming them down a little bit so that they aren't so out of the tube, crazy yellow. Um, and we have to control them with all the other objects within that space. Um, that This low key structure helps us do that. It helps us retain a certain value quality between one object and another. It helps us tone down the colors so that we don't have um, a breach in the system, and a breach in the system would be to make everything grayish except for that banana that's bright yellow, and yet we want the focus to be the clear glass that's sitting next to it. How can we do that? Well, we have to figure out how to shift objects in their chroma or in their colorfulness and figure out how to tone them back so that we can push the focus somewhere else and with some other device. Maybe high contrast will be the focal element that we use instead of it being a color. But because that banana is in the picture, we have to find a way to fight with it in order to knock it back and make something else more important. So that's what this chroma structure is all about. It's, it's teaching you how to see color on another level that has to do with light and locality. And between the two of those, um, you, you start to, your eye starts to develop. This is one of the most important things that we want to keep in mind with every art class. It's not about getting an A on every project. It's about developing your eye, developing your mind, developing your hand and the reflexes that it has, and linking those three things together so that you can see something and respond to it artistically. It's allowing you to get rid of all of the, the flaws in your, in your dexterity. It's, it's getting rid of the bland pedestrian eyeball that doesn't take note of color or shape or perspective. And it's allowing it to be heightened to a new level so that you can see all of these things as an artist. You can look at something and say, hey, that's sitting at about 60 degrees. It has two vanishing points going that way and that way. It has a kind of a high chroma or a middle chroma look to it. And its inherent local color isn't brown, but it's an orangey base color. Right, which is also what low chroma does. Low chroma and high chroma exercises help you look at all the grays and identify what the root color is. So when you look at the dirt, you can say, oh, that dirt has an inherent redness to it. So then you start with red instead of just like brown out of the tube, which doesn't really get you the color you're looking for. You find the chromatic hues that build that color base, and you respond to that immediately. It's a reflex. So we're developing those reflexes, we're developing the eye, we're developing a, a vocabulary that we can achieve. Our mind connects it to our eye and our hand and allows us to communicate in whatever means we need to communicate it through. So with that being said about light, we also practice with sky colors. And what this is is a chart based upon the time of day and the way that the sun and the sky appear together within the day. Um, so in, our, in, our, in my digital landscape painting class, because it's, we have the luxury of breaking photographs down and we're not all blinded by the light outside, um, we can actually take things apart and chart them. Um, so we cover things in that class like the Fresnel effect and other effects that water produces. And we break it down scientifically so that we understand reflection, refraction, absorption. And we can look at water and say, hey, I can paint this crazy looking creek bed that's going off towards the sun, becoming a mirror, going even further out into a reflection where there's water rip, uh, blowing across it, creating ripples. And I know how to handle those ripples because I understand their movement, their motion, and their shape. 
And as well, when I look down below at my feet, I can see down into the rocks and everything below in there. And I know how to put a color distortion to it so that those rocks look wet and the ones on the sand bank look dry. Just like whatever time of day it is, I can depend. Is it going to be 1 o'clock in the afternoon or 6 o'clock in the evening during summertime up north in Canada, right? Because I understand light well enough because of the coloration of the light and the combination of sun and sky together creating a certain color effect, um, I can get to it. I can produce that. Um, so we break the light down. And like I said, um, as far as these classes go, um, we're very scientific about it. Because that's what our foundation is. Art is the science of seeing. So when we break it down in a very scientific uh, way, it's easier to retain the information because it's chartable. If it were just a let's go out and paint landscapes every day, maybe a few of you would get it and some of you might not. But in this way, everybody stands a chance of understanding something because this is how it all works. If we didn't have light, we wouldn't see anything. But because we have light and it's measurable, we can see all these different things. And from there, we can break it down into variables that are easy to then deduce as a science. Um, do we want it in perspective? Well, that's a science of geometry, the geometry of objects in three-dimensional space. Just like color theory is the science of objects in depth of field, as well as co uh, closeness and clarity. Um, the light, the color of it measurable, and the objects, the color of them measurable. And, and it makes it, sometimes it can make it a little bit dry at first, but remember that all you're doing is you're restructuring your mind and your eyes to understand how all of this works. There isn't anything artful about that. But what you do as an artist, as the emotional entity that you are, you will take all of this information and you'll create something with it. And the more that you know about all this information, the easier that creation is for you because you're not guessing and hacking away at that anymore. You know certain things. The only thing left is the emotional output. What kind of brushwork do I want to use? What kind of materials do I want to use? How do I hey, want to use? Hey, Ron. Yes. I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, please use full screen. This one's really small. Thanks. Oh, my apologies. So we take settings like this and we break it down. If I were to show you the layer structure, which is the reason why I wanted this, you can see that in this, here we have the blue sky as an effect. And I kind of need this uh, at the screen size that it is. Let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Um, I'll just zoom in on the pictures here. Hey guys, uh, just so you know too, I'm, I'm on a, uh, an iPad here. You can double touch, double click the screen, and it will zoom in. And then you can uh, uh, zoom in further with your fingers. So, whatever device you're on, I imagine there's a zoom through Adobe Connect too. Oh, excellent. Thank you. So here we have um, thank you. I and the the warm sun, and these are both broken down into different layers. And the way that we do a lot of the painting in there is through the layer structure, trying to emulate the light sources. So at first, we paint local colors. And local colors are the different objects. And then we put a bit of shadow to those local objects so that there is already the basis for how we're going to light the certain areas within the picture space. And then we discover the time of day so that we can get the color correct um, in whatever layer it might be, whether it's the, the shaded side of the layered structure or the sunlit side of the, of the, the light structure. Um, and so again, more exercises to help us break these things down. And then we also get into the layering structure of how you put a picture together um, digitally. And I won't go through all of the different layers here because there's so many of them. But in this particular demonstration, what we did was we built every object by itself. Um, the wall is one object. Um, the mountains in the background are one object. The sky is one object. The cloud is one object. And we learn to see each object one by one by one. Um, and we kind of take in the properties of that object. First, we look at its local color and its shape. Then we look at the lighting that's hitting it from different directions. And then we also look at things like, is it soft and ethereal? Or is it 
hard and rigid? Is it a, is it a bumpy structure? Um, does it have a lot of texture to it? Um, and we take it apart in that way so that we learn to identify what makes these things look the way they do. And then because we're working digitally, we try to find the tools that can allow us to develop that quickly um, so that we're not laboring one grass blade at a time, one little pore in a rock at a time. We're actually looking for the tool set that allows us to get there quicker, which is the beauty of digital over traditional, because traditional, we obviously have to painstakingly put it all together. But there's nothing wrong with doing that. If you enjoy exploring materials, you'll find the same thing that we're doing in Photoshop with paint. You'll just grab for different brushes and try things out as brushes that you didn't think you would ever use. I'll try that sponge over there. Maybe that'll be a good brush. Or maybe I'll use my thermal shirt today because I like all those little holes in it and I want to get some kind of mesh pattern really quickly, whatever it might be. Hopefully you have enough discovery in you to use physical tools in the same way Photoshop allows you to create a brush to make something almost immediately. There's, Photoshop emulates reality. So to say that Photoshop is the only distinct tool that can do this is a misnomer. We can actually do that in reality. It's just when we're using traditional media, um, it can get a little messy and things can feel a little disconnected. There, we do want some kind of harmony amongst all the brush strokes. But regardless, we do this first in Photoshop so that we can at least exercise the, the concept. And then from there, that's up to you to go and explore the other materials and how you might do them with those particulars. Um, and then I think I have one more here. We also get involved in surface demonstration. So like with this hill, for example, this is a good example because it does show you the rolling of the surfaces. And so we do the same thing here, only we break it down into geometric constructs. And it looks very much like we're using 3D Max or Maya here, but we're working in Photoshop, or we could be working in pencil and paint. It doesn't really matter. But the idea of finding the direction of light and how that directional light affects the surfaces as they're ever changing is uh, something very important that we also discover and, and work with and practice and repeat as often as possible. And the more that we put our mind to these tasks and the more that we repeat it, the more this becomes our way of working instead of it just being, I have a brush, there's a thing, let me start right here and hope to get over there by the end of the day. Um, you have that at your disposal if you choose to, but you can also fall back upon this other means of breaking something down and making it a little bit easier for yourself. And by doing that, then you can build a routine or you can build a way of painting for yourself that feels uh, I don't want to necessarily say cliche from one picture to the next, but having a work routine that's consistent is a really nice thing because especially if you're going to be doing, say, a dozen illustrations for a client or you're going to be doing 10 concept paintings for today only to get to 10 more tomorrow, you definitely have to have a process for you to be able to work through so that you don't get bogged down in all of the little nuts and bolts. It's really easy to all of a sudden become too precious with a picture. And when you're in an entertainment situation, especially when you're in an entertainment art job, um, you can't become that precious artist where every brushstroke counts to the fullest. You have to actually kind of let go of that part of you and lean into the, the development of the images. Because at the end of the day, it really is about the bulk of what you do and not necessarily the individual things that you're building within each canvas. Although there is something to that, and if you can practice your skills at such a high level over here, you can implement it any way you need to elsewhere, and no matter how rapid you are with your picture making, there's always that little voice in the back of your mind that says, nope, yes, nope, yep, check this, fix that, oops, I made that wrong, fix that, and that's basically what you're training, that's your intuition. And again, the more you practice that, the, the clearer the vision, and the more receptive you are to that voice within you that helps regulate where you're going with things as you're making them. So then we get into the nuts and bolts of things and that would be the smaller nuances like head drawing and figure drawing and so forth. And um, that would be these images here. Let me first start with this. 
So the very beginning of all of it starts with learning how the skeleton works and beginning with simplifying the skeleton, which is what this chart is right here. This is a simplification of the skeleton. Um, taking all of the rigid surfaces underneath the skin and saying, okay, this is how the structure works. This is where things go. Um, these are called landmarks, and this is where muscles are attached. So now that we understand this to some extent, then we need to animate it, and we need to be able to put it into different poses. Um, and then develop on top of that. Um, and I'm going to switch over to the camera here in just a moment so that I can show you that. But I do think I have a few of these charts that I can also show you. Um, this is the rib cage and the pelvis now broken down into different actions. And again, you can see the simple structure. There's two things going on here. We have the skeleton and then we have what I call the armature, which is the cylinder forms, and in this case for the torso, this pillow-like shape that um, is structural. The bottom points of the pillow are the great trochanters, the top points are the um, acromion processes, um, words that you'll learn if you get involved in anatomy. Otherwise, they're just a bunch of uh, Latin gobbledygook. Um, but this, this basic structure here is the foundation for drawing things simply. And when you look at this kind of puppet here, and then go back and think about that Bouguereau, those Bouguereau sketches I was showing you. Hey, there's a connection here. It's called simplification. And when you can simplify something that's extremely complex down into a very simple gesture, you then have a basic tool that you can practice with until you find the thing you're looking for. And then you can stack the complex information back on top of that. The bones, the muscles, the shading, drape it with clothing, and so forth. It allows you, it's backwards, it's backwards construction. You're, nice, you're taking it all the way back down to something basic so that you can use it for a certain purpose, and then you can reverse that dynamic back in the other direction to take it to a finish. And in this case also, by keeping it very simple like these uh, drawings are, um, it allows you uh, an opportunity to explore the pose, to explore the accent or the, um, the attitude of what it is that you're trying to find. And that's very important because for some of us, especially when we're new to art, we don't know where to begin at all. So to draw the human form is this daunting task where we look at all of it and go, oh my gosh, there's so many fingers and toes and the eyeballs and this and that. And everything it kind of overwhelms us. But once we understand this, it actually takes it back to something much, much uh, easier, something more digestible. Um, and again, it gives us the opportunity to explore so that we can find in that language, that visual language, what it is that we're trying to develop up um, without any of the other stuff getting in the way. Because quite frankly, especially with a picture, details are not the important thing. It's the bigger structure first that's more important. And then the details just support that. Now, when, it gets to, when we get to say something like a facial expression, yes, it is important that we capture that expression. But it isn't such an important thing in the beginning that we have to begin with it. We can begin with something much easier. Um, so then we, are, we move on from uh, that to the head. Uh, wait, never mind. Well, we can talk about this for just a moment. This is a digital painting done in one of my digital classes, digital portraiture. Um, and we practice the head. The head in itself is its own expressive vehicle. Um, and so we put a lot of uh, emphasis on this as well uh, because, you know, regardless of how stylized that picture might be, we need to understand what are the key components of structure that make the head so important. And um, I'm going to flip over to the camera here for just a moment. Maybe. Just go ahead and start your webcam. Whoa, where'd he go? Oh, oh shit. Dude. Uh huh. We lost. Will your mic you, on? You yeah. 
Yeah, whoever uh, is talking, your mic's on. Uh, it's pretty obvious Ron got bumped. <laughs> okay, so this is a combination of construction and abstraction. And basically, this is just taking the, the head structure and simplifying it down into simple masses. The likeness comes from this first. It doesn't come from the eyeballs that blink in the nostrils that we stick our fingers up on and the mouth that opens up and talks. Those are not important. It's the surfaces that those little things sit on top of. And if we can get that surface structure correct, which again falls back into the skeleton, then we have a likeness. So the key area is the brow ridge, the cheekbone structure, the jaw and the tooth cylinder. Those are the three points of the head that are most important for any kind of a likeness. If we get those surfaces accurate, then the details are nothing more than accentuating who the individual is, but the individual is already there. We should be able to see it. And if we can break it down into this kind of structure, we can already see all of the different surfaces that we're going to be lighting and shading. And lo and behold, we don't need a light source anymore. We can invent that. Um, now, given that everything is going to be polished down to a much smoother surface later on, but the structure remains the same. Where bones change direction, are uni that's universal on everybody's face. It's the kind of structure that you develop first that's very important uh, for us. Um, so well, this is kind of the, the, the last layer. And then we go into um, uh, this. Then we get into expression. And when we get into expressions, again, it's going to look a little daunting at first because it's, it's this insanity here. Um, and it kind of it goes through and it shows all of these first muscles and then it gets involved with the direction that the muscles work in. But this is how all the expressions work. And so this is another layer of head drawing that we get involved with that shows us how to get the face to move. Um, and so when we learn how to identify this stuff and we rehearse it enough, then we can express any kind of quality of expression within an individual, regardless of their likeness, regardless of their structure, uh, because it's just manipulating the shape and manipulating the skin surface um, to create that expression that we're looking for. Norman Rockwell was really good at this, all of these things that I was talking about. Um, he's, he's really, really, he was really good at manipulating those surfaces. Because he understood so much behind all of this logic, he was able to capture a human being in, unlike almost anyone else. He was able to stylize it, synthesize the realism, stylize it, and then express it in a way that is, punctuates the exact expression and emotion that he was trying to capture. And he did it consistently over and over and over again. Now, when we look at guys like Norman Rockwell, we wonder, well, is there ever going to be another one? Well, all we need to learn is what he learned and then in, in put it to practice. And then we also have to, uh, it needs to be a part of what we do as an artist in order for us to really capture it and take advantage of that. Because let's say if we're going to be a concept artist, these aren't as important for us as it is for the illustrator. Because in the illustration, there's something more direct to the audience that's involved. Um, while expression is a part of character design because we need to show the animator what kinds of expressions an individual might be, um, might be going through in the video game or in the movie that we're going to build using those models. Um, it's in the illustration, it's in the storytelling, the storyboards, the comic book art, um, the cover art that we do that is really going to hit an emotional string for the audience. And that's where we want to put this to practice. Now, the other part of figure drawing here that I have in paper form that I wanted to show is the muscle layers because I didn't really have um, an example of that in the computer. I was just showing most of this, the armature. And this is your skeletal armature. And when we're in um, the figure construction class, this is what we do a lot of. We take poses apart. 
we break it down into several layers. In fact, those layers that you can see here, I think, more easily. So this is what you would call the armature, missing the foot, of course. Bad instruction there. I don't know who hired this guy. Then we take it to the skeletal level, and we draw a skeleton over the top of that armature so that we learn what the structure is sitting underneath it. Because again, this is where the muscles are going to be hinged down. And then we do the musculature. And the musculature is another layer. And all of those layers together kind of fit together to create the end result, the end product of the human form. And then we'll go one step further than that later on in class, and we'll do a shaded layer. Um, and that would just be drawing the picture again with the skin over the top of the muscles so that you can see the lighting coming from the direction that it's coming from. Um, and that shading is a result of all these other steps. This information, the way that it is, is why, that you, why you see the model lit and the shadow patterns that you see on the model. Um, in fact, you can kind of see them here. Um, I have shaded some of these muscles on their side structure um, in the direction that the lighting was hitting this particular model. Um, but these are the different things that we do in class. And this is like the daily exercise. These are the daily um, uh, demonstrations that I show in class. Uh, to get a good idea of what it is that we're doing in class. I don't leave you on your own at all. I do everything with you. Um, so you get an opportunity to see me do it first. Because the way that I kind of, I came through in school, um, show first and then do was the process for doing that. And it allowed for brand new artists, somebody who's never done this before, a way of getting there. Um, and then for the advanced artist, it showed a few things like, oh, I was never going to draw it that way, but maybe I'll try that this time. And it gives you some, I guess, trick tips that help you get to the end product um, in a much easier way. Um, however, as we advance in our school and we move forward into the upper division classes, there's a little less of this because it's up to you at that point to start to form your own voice. And if we do this too often, then all too often you might think this is the only way that you're supposed to do it. And by no means is this the only way to draw the figure. This is just a way of breaking it down so that in class you have a way of getting to an end result and cutting it up into layers. And of course, because I'm teaching it, I can show you a process for getting there. Um, and But like I said, as, the, as time rolls on and we move up into the upper division classes, you're no longer led by so much example. You're, you're more on your own at that point, and you have problems to solve. We give you greater problems to solve that don't involve the mechanical nuts and bolts anymore. It's more about putting it all together from all the different classes that you've already taken and synthesize it down into an answer, which would be an illustration or a high-pitch concept piece or a storyboard sequence or an animation sequence or canvases for an art show. That would be the end result. So, you know, we, we show, you know, different things like, okay, you can hold a pencil like this like you write, but um, this is your hinge point then, and it limits the rotation of your hand. So if you hold the pencil this way, or this way, or this way, and then hover above the page, it allows you more flexibility and more mobility so that you can create ovals of whatever kind so that you have control over a very specific mechanical line if you need to without using a ruler. Or if you want that line to be more organic, you hold it back further, and that allows for variation. My pulse, my dialogue as I'm speaking, the coffee that I drank this morning, all of that will get involved in that line and produce something a little bit different than this other. Um, we also show you things like, okay, shading, we go in one direction if we can help it. We try to use the broad side of the pencil because this is developed as a paintbrush or a series of paintbrushes from your smallest to your widest. And that then gets rid of the whole idea of I have to sit there and shade a picture like this all day long, right? But then you have that option as well. Or to talk about how hatching works or how cross-hatching works or how veiling works. You know, all of these different things are the mechanics that we can show. And this is, again, why the camera is such an important tool, because I can show you these things here without needing to be in a classroom setting with all of you. And then that gives you the opportunity to say, you know what, I don't like holding the pencil this way. 
or this way. I do like holding it this way, but I get what they're saying about this thing, so I won't put it down on the page. I'll just keep my hand elevated up, and it'll help me make a different kind of line, the line that I like to produce. Um, and that's the beauty of having the camera here, because when we do the demos, all the demos are done through the camera. If, if I can help it, most of them are done traditionally, except for when we get to the digital classes, of course. Um, but to be able to see it traditionally first. Another thing that's really important about the traditional media, for those of you who are digital only, is that this piece of paper and this pencil have a combination of a tactile feeling. And that feeling is the recorded memory that you take in. And that's what helps you repeat that motion and that movement if you need to repeat it, is having done it before. It's like swinging a bat or plunking down the keys on a keyboard lightly or vigorously. Those are all recorded memories, muscle memories. And the more that you practice that, the easier it is to recall. When we work on digital surfaces, the digital plastic, or the plastic that um, is the layer that we work with for the digital material is a barrier that prevents you from recording this information because you won't remember. Um, it's a slippery surface and it doesn't allow you to say, oh yes, that's right, that feeling. Um, it, it completely omits that. So I have everybody work traditionally first because in here at least you get a, a chance to experience it and you get a chance to feel it. If I want a light line, I know what that feels like as opposed to bearing down too heavy as a heavy-handed person and then finding the balance in between. <clears throat> to be able to take a pencil and go from thin to thick in one swab gives me an opportunity to see, oh, that's a way that I can draw instead of having to do the thick part by doing this and then getting thinner and so forth. It allows me some experience with these tools in a way that I can find my voice. I can find that individual direction that will allow for me to express the way I would like my art to be expressed. And it, I can retain those memories. And I can't do that as easily when I'm working with the plastic surfaces. Now, when we go into the, the digital part of it, hopefully you're taking all these tools in and it will help you make decisions that much quicker when you're working digitally. I call it tradigital because it's a combination of the two, the traditional means in a digital setting. And the combination of the two is a really powerful tool. That's when you step up your game and you become a really avid digital artist. Everything that you produce now has some meaning to it because you're in search of traditional marks possibly, but you're using digital tools to get them done that much quicker. And it's, a, and it's exciting to be able to combine both of those elements together. I take digital art and I build my concept so that I can paint it traditionally. And at the same time with digital art, there's this fearlessness in there because you have that endless undo if you choose. You try things out and you make noise of a certain kind, mark making of a certain kind. And then you say, okay, well now that I made those marks there, how can I get a paintbrush to make it? So the two of them chase each other hand in hand and it makes you a, a fearless artist no matter what materials you hold on to because you know that one supports the other and has and it's helped you see something already that otherwise you would say to yourself, oh that $50 tube of paint and that $25 brush and I need to make these crazy marks, uh, I don't know if I want to do that with these materials. There's certain hesitation behind some of the things that we purchase if we don't have that in us, that instinct in us to just try, um, we have hesitation. But by having seen it done before in one media, it allows us the opportunity to explore it in the other. And that's also where I say you're going to stack both of these types of media together. It's not going to be all digital and it's not going to be all traditional. It's going to be a combination of the two. Even as a fine artist, this is a most valuable workflow because it gives you the time to explore something without having used a single material yet. And then those materials become more precious in terms of making the final marks. Um, because maybe over here in the computer, I screwed around with some stuff to get an idea, an inkling. and what kind of tools I'm going to use to try to make those marks. 
So as far as fine art goes, it's also an extremely valuable tool. And I know a lot of fine artists that refuse to touch the computer, but that's a shame because they're losing out on an opportunity of so much exploration that can be done on the off hours. If you need that beautiful blue light during the day of north light coming through your studio and you only get six of those hours in the short of winter, then there's a wasted day surrounding those six hours when you can be on the computer exploring your next painting that evening and then by the next day set everything up and you're ready to go to paint it. So it just it enhances the ability of you becoming a better fine artist because you're looking at how all of these tools work in conjunction with one another. So there was one other thing that I wanted to show back over in the other board and I'm going to be very brief about this um, and, and uh, hopefully I can get back to it okay. Um, and that was the figure invention uh, because it was figure invention Oh, oops. Well, I can't show it right now because I'm not in uh, uh, Firefox. Uh, you guys don't need to see it anyway. Who cares about figure inventing, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but with uh, the figure construction stuff, it, it gives you the tool set to allow yourself to invent it from the figure. And that's another layer of the whole process of figure drawing that we go through when we do the figure construction stuff. It, by the end of the class, you're inventing. We're not just copying pictures anymore. And again, key, very key. Um, I use it for almost every illustration I do. Um, I don't use reference very much. Um, I only look for it for, say, an individual face I've never drawn before that I want a certain type infused within this figure. But because I've studied lighting in the figure and the anatomy and space and all of that, most of the images that I do, I make up completely um, after I've showered myself with enough reference to help me educate myself in the direction that I'm going. Um, I explore now using the full potential of my creative powers um, because with that then, there is no, oh my gosh, did I get that face right? Oh my gosh, did I get that clothing right? It's more about now you know what a finished picture is supposed to look like, shoot for it and go for it. And there's more expressiveness in that piece now because you're not limited by the reference. Now it's all distilled and filtered, pure, um, pure media and pure stylization, um, which at that point makes art really fun. That's why, again, I kind of halter, uh, fall, uh, fall back upon Rubens or Fortunio Matania. These guys were making it up. So there's a certain excitement in their work um, that you can't get if you get too caught up in the photographic reference. Using that reference just as a starting point and then allowing yourself to develop your piece will create more character and it'll create more personality within it. Filtered, of course, because it's going through you, but it, it, it gives you the opportunity to, now to make something very lively with it. Um, and that's what I do personally with my own work. It doesn't mean that everybody has to do that. I just challenge myself with that because why not? We've developed all these skills to get to that potential. Why not tap into that potential now? So that's the importance of all this foundation stuff. Now I hope to do some other lectures later on where we really just capitalize on one subject or the other. But I hope you found that valuable as far as how all the tools kind of work in conjunction with each other and how we go about showing you how all that stuff works. Thanks for sharing this day with us. John, you want to jump on?
and and I have one last little tidbit to share with everybody. In about a year, I'm going to have a figure drawing book that comes out with uh, Design Studio Press, which is going to cover quite a lot of what I just showed you. But it's a series of books. There's going to be four of them. The figure as it's constructed, the figure as it's rendered, color theory and perspective with the figure and composition. So a lot of these things will be out there later on. But that's no substitute for actually being in the class because it's in that personal experience one-on-one -on -one with us that you're going to have more growth than just by copying something out of a book. But I did want to share that with you because I'm looking forward to getting those books out there and getting them to you guys. They're going to be augmented reality books, so there's going to be a lot of interaction within the books as well. So look for the first one probably by next fall, I think, is when it's going to be out. So anyway, that's the last thing I wanted to share there. Thank you, Ron. And again, um, Ron's ability to take the scientific route of what a lot of people refer to as the artist's intuition. And there's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot to be said, to be said for the personal development of an artist and how their intuition takes them their direction. But there's also a lot to be said for the scientific side of it. And uh, Ron does a very good job in both directions. It's extremely important and it's a necessity and it's your really only defense mechanism as an artist in the industry is identifying yourself. It starts here, it starts in this, this strong foundations and we, we offer, um, you know, you can tell, uh, you know, the best thing to do uh, when you check out any, any place, any, any institution is look at what comes out, look at the other end, go to our student gallery, uh, take a look at the student's work and look at the faculty's work. And uh, I think it speaks for itself. So um, with that said, uh, again, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. I would like to take a look at a few portfolios. We're not going to be able to do this too long. We can, we'll develop another um, uh, uh, event that's just for portfolio reviews. But I'd like to, to uh, show a couple today because I think it's a, you know, gets people thinking in the right direction about uh, the importance of what they show and where they are. And um, while I'm you're gonna have to give me uh, just a second here, because my desktop, I'm a, I'm a little bit afraid of what's going to come up here. Um, see, I do this properly. And I think it's best if I control control this so I can click through some um, here we go there we go and I'm going to start there's a few people I certainly recognize their work in here and um, I want to I guess we could start at a number a uh, number of these but I'm gonna, I'll start with John Pacer John was at the Academy this summer He's a DeviantArt contest winner. And Sterling and um, Ron, please speak up and suggest, can, can everybody see what, because I can't see my screen anymore. Um, the one thing I can see is the advertisement for the Academy of Art University, <laughs> which uh, I don't like very much. Um, but um, if we can see, I'm going to, I'm going to click, I'm going to scroll through. I'm scrolling. Um, I didn't even check. Is uh, John in the room? Um, I can't tell. I should have looked before. I, I didn't know if he was in the room or not. Somebody can tell me. I know John's very interested in his, his focused on uh, he is developing not. himself. He is not? Okay. Uh, that was maybe not the best suggestion of, of putting his work up first since he's not in the room. Um, I'll bounce out um, and just, and, but I, I just wanted to uh, uh, suggest that uh, John's a pretty mature painter and uh, he's he's really has developed himself. I, I, I don't know if uh, Sterling or Ron want to say something as we're looking at these. Um, it would be, it would be helpful. Um, Sterling, do you have the mic?
Yeah, I'm here, guys. Um, hopefully my audio is coming through okay. Um, yeah, I, you know, I remember John's work. Uh, there were several of these pieces that what struck me about them was, you know, there, there's a paint quality to them. And uh, there's obviously some, some real uh, interesting decision-making going on. But I was really struck by just the marriage of shape and design. And as much as what John has sh decided to show in some of these paintings, I'm impressed with what he hasn't shown. And uh, I think that, that when you say that he's a mature artist, I start thinking about some of those elements that, that could have been interjected in there that really would have taken away from things that he was trying to bring attention and focus to. And uh, you know, the image that you have on the screen right now, I remember seeing that one before too. It's, you know, if someone came to me and said, you know, I'm going to do a painting, um, a narrative painting or narrative illustration of a guy loading cardboard boxes, the subject matter and the content is pretty uh, banal. And, and I think that it's going to, you know, at first blush be like, well, you know, what is there in the storytelling? What is there in the narrative there? That goes back to what John is working on and his personal point of view. He might want to focus on elements of the mundane to see if he can bring a dynamic and an interest to them. You know, we, we start to get into what Ram was talking about of the artist intent. And I think that that carries a lot of weight as to what we paint, what we get excited about painting, the challenges and problems that we're trying to solve that we framed ourselves. And uh, I guess that's kind of what I see in some of these images of John's. I, I definitely think that some work better then, uh, oh, you guys are having trouble hearing me. Is that any better? No, we can hear you fine. No, we can hear you fine. Okay. Uh, John, Turn up my mic too. John, into the page you a little bit? zoom into the page a little bit? You may be able to hold down you control to hold down and control roll and your. Zoom wheel. Zoom or through this. Okay. Or through this. Okay. Okay. I'll jump back in. Um, Roberto, is this? We see the name John Pacer on here. You said that you saw your page up there. Maybe it was just uh, getting keyed up. Oh, probably the tabs. Anyways, um, instead of rehashing kind of what I've already said about. John's work here, you know, I will point out that he definitely has some work that you've shown just real quickly on the screen, John. Some of it's a lot stronger than others, and I'm more drawn to those things that feel casual, that feel a little bit um, more as if the viewers are part of the storytelling, than some of the things that are a little bit more staged. Um, you know, I think there's an action scene here with the plane and everything else. Um, Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to deal with it. Start reading the, the chat, can't control the images that are on the screen, so it's a little hard to balance all of this. Um, this image here, the Space Cowboy, feels much more staged to me. And uh, it feels, my mind instantly goes to, okay, there's someone who was set up as the model, and the lighting was very well-defined and articulated. And I don't know that those types of images don't res don't resonate with me personally as much as some of the other ones that feel designed with more of an intent. So beautifully painted, um, you know, image. But again, it just feels a bit more staged. So that's where where I'll leave it, John. And uh, without talking too much about um, John Pacer's work here. Hey, I'll jump in real quick. I think we have 10 minutes left in the session, so you can plan. OK. Uh, can you hear me, Dorian? Yes, I can. And that's okay, not good. just me deciding we have 10 minutes. The system actually send a notice that the room will end. Okay. So system that's limitations. Uh, the reason I ask because when you took control here, uh, you wiped I don't have any tools in front of me. So I'm just going to click through, and I'm kind of just do, doing my best to, um, and uh, Sterling, please continue to talk. Um, this is uh, Jess uh, Wisniewski, and um, 
Sterling, I thought actually you would be the right person to respond to this, Sterling, because um, I, I, I think you 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 might have an opinion about the direction of this work and some of the uh, things, the problems that can come from from uh, I don't know fan art or going this direction. Jesse, uh, hi, Sterling here. Um, what I would say first is uh, it's a really difficult thing to begin differentiating for someone going through foundations who's trying to figure out how to draw, how to paint, um, to have this discussion. But I'll, I'll see if it kind of um, makes some sense to you here. Everything that I'm seeing here is so dependent upon photography. And many of these are other people's photography that we miss your own intent and your own intent might be to draw something representationally that falls squarely into the realm of an acquired skill set which is a very important skill set to have and it's something that you uh, can deliberately kind of go through and and continue to master at some point though what i would equate this to is being like a cover artist for another musician right you learn to play your notes, you learn to play your chords, you learn to start playing rhythm, uh, and ultimately you end up covering other people's songs to learn to better your craft. I would assume that most musicians get into performing music or making music because they want to write their own music. And I see the same thing with visual artists, that at some point you've got to say, you know, I really personally have something to say, and I need to make a departure from these things that other artists have created. And I, when I say artists, I say photographers uh, in, in that group as well. So you're going to have uh, some issues not only with that, but um, there's some real copyright concerns. That Robert Johnson uh, portrait that you have there, um, I've worked from that back when I was a student. And uh, there are people working for the Robert Johnson estate. This is the blues musician with the guitar here, who uh, are doggedly pursuing the two photographs and infringements upon the two photographs of Robert Johnson. I'm not saying this to scare you. I think that uh, you'll probably be fine with this. Um, but those are the types of things that you have to be concerned with and aware of that someone's going to look at that and say, you know, that's that's not enough of a uh, new direction or new interpretation of that photograph to call it your own. So these are kind of harsh words, I know, sometimes to, to hear this. But I think that what I see is a, a really strong skill set for seeing things and interpreting them, uh, well, more emulating them. The next step moving forward would be interpretation. How do you change this, alter this, start with your own intent, and then bring your reference or your research into it to make it do what you want it to do, not to have you reiterate what's already been stated. So that's kind of my reaction to that, John. Um, I hope that makes some sense, guys. Yeah, I'm going to uh, repeat a quote that Sterling said in front of a group of students one day at the Illustration Academy. And he, we were talking about the use of reference and using reference, and it just kind of came out. He said, do not let that reference push you around. And, and I thought, man, that is such a great thing to deliver to a student. A, a refer reference, as Ron pointed, reference is there to give you the information to complete your picture. And it needs to be your picture. Uh, my my take on a lot of the work that's here that you have a very good skill set here, Jess. But yeah, and very similar to what Sterling said. Um, but you have to develop yourself creatively, develop yourself your ability to create an image on your own, because a lot of these are in other people's images, and you need to be very careful of that. And but it's a it's a it's a good way to learn. It's a good way to develop your skills, but at the same time, you should be developing the skill, the other skills that um, Ron pointed out in his in, his, in, in the uh, construction of the um, uh, composition talk about developing a, a picture. What Bouguereau went through. What are the what are the what are, what are the, the painstaking uh, number of uh, thumbnails that he did to produce those images, and that's really where the picture starts and really. This is about picture making, and it's not about copying. Uh, ultimately, that's where you want to be. So oh, let me go to somebody else. Uh, well, I think, you know, 
go. Hey, John, let, let me jump in one last thing here. Um, Great. Jess, if I had to kind of summarize everything we just said, and I, I saw what you said up there, and I think that's a perfectly justifiable statement. Um, so understand that we're just talking about the long view of a career and where, certainly where you start. But if there's a word that I could give to it, it would be distinction. Every single artist who is looking to create something new or original is looking for distinction. And the very first place to, to, to go or to start pushing away from looking like other, someone else's work is to begin with your own ideas. So uh, any business uh, that goes out there, and John, you've been through this, uh, I've seen you go through this with Tad, we've had to clearly identify what was distinct about the Tad business, this Tad school. Um, and we see this going from any startup to any entrepreneur to any artist to any writer. You're really trying to figure out what's unique about you and what you're offering um, as opposed to what's already been done before. Otherwise, what's the point? Oh, I, I completely agree. Developing yourself is ultimately your best defense uh, as uh, to, to get into the industry, but to stay in the industry. Developing yourself personally, creating your own point of view. Um, I think we're going to have to stop because we're going to get kicked out of the room as Dorian's explaining this. Um, we will be having on um, the, uh, the week before the 22nd, so February, um, two weeks from now. Uh, what, what date is that? I apologize. I've, I've lost control of, I can't move things around here. Um, John, you got an email up on the screen right now. Oh, great. I'll get rid of it. Um, sorry. Thank you. Um, I was trying to find my information, which I can't. Um, let me look at my calendar here. February 15th, we'll be doing another one of these. And I would hope that all of you would attend. Or if you can, we'll send out a notice that you'll be on our list that you can attend. We're going to, we're, we're, doing these uh, consistently. Uh, we'll probably do every other week for the next few months. And um, uh, please please join us. And please don't hesitate to contact me or contact the art department with any questions about how we can assist you in, in developing your career. So thank you, everybody. Ron, that was a fantastic talk. I think I thank you for putting the effort and time into doing that. And Sterling, thank you. Uh, for being here to assist and everybody else that helped me put this thing together. So um, I think we need to say goodbye before Adobe boots us out. So again, thank you everybody. Come visit the department.